Distinguished Lecture Series, the Graduate Design Candidates Week program, and the General Studies program. Um, for those of you that were uh, att in attendance this morning for the Candidates Week presentation, many of the points that I will make in introducing the lecture you will have already heard, but I believe bear repeating in any case. Um, Terry Riley is an architect and a very fine architect, but he's here for other reasons, and I want to, and I think it's important to uh, focus on those. Um, he is, of course, the curator of architecture and design at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, but before he became the curator, I first learned of Terry because of a book and an exhibition he assembled on the work of uh, perhaps a little-known architect, Paul Nelson, but um, an architect who, in retrospect, deserves some revisiting. The Paul Nelson exhibition focused on many projects, but in particular a project called The Caged House. Uh, the exhibition was mounted at the Buell Center at Columbia, and uh, this was about the same time as the Deconstructivist exhibition, and I thought it quite a curiosity. Why would anybody be looking at Paul Nelson? If you go back and you look at the book from that exhibition, and The Caged House in particular, I think you'll find it to be quite um, interesting in how it anticipates um, many of the developments in speculative architecture that have, that have come to fore after deconstructivism, um, particularly in its treatment of neo-modernism and its floating section. So I, I think it was quite interesting to discover Terry Riley on the basis of this, um, this role as curator and historian. Soon afterwards, he took over the position of curator at the Museum of Modern Art. Now, um, there's probably a justified skepticism about the center of the world status of the Museum of Modern Art, but nevertheless, it is a significant institution in the um, d global history and development of architecture. And it's particularly interesting because it's been the scene of a kind of advocacy curatorial a critical advocacy in its curatorial role. I mean, if everyone knows Philip Johnson was the first curator and, and the, the significance of many of his exhibitions, including the uh, International Style show, immediately after Philip Johnson, uh, Arthur Drexler, um, who's probably his most important and famous show was the Beaux-Arts exhibition. Now, in retro again, we may not be particularly happy with the um, the idea of recovering an interest in the Beaux-Arts, but at the time it was a very important exhibition. After that, however, the museum entered into a kind of quiet period where it was consolidating centrist issues and showing exhibitions of Asplund and um, Ricardo Bofill and Leon Creer and, and in interesting architects, but architects that the museum was taking a position essentially of trying to consolidate its strengths and identify mainstream issues in architecture and present those to the public. Immediately after Terry Riley took over, um, the whole situation changed at the Museum of Modern Art. Early, the first exhibition, I believe, or an early exhibition was the uh, NARA Convention Center competition, which was won by Arato Isazaki, but, but within uh, months of it having been completed, it was shown and discussed at the Museum of Modern Art. That exhibition has been followed by one-person shows for um, various people, including Bernard Schumi and Ram Koolhouse. And, at the, and the press has been greeting the, these changes at the Museum of Modern Art instead of sort of polite um, criticism or polite praise with quite uh, a, a, um, a much more extreme either praise or condemnation. And I think it's indicative of the kinds of risks and the repositioning of the, the Museum of Modern Art and the role of the curator in general that Terry Riley has been um, responsible for. And for that reason, I think we're very delighted to have him as our speaker tonight. So let me introduce to you Terry Riley. Thank you. Um, by coincidence, uh, thank you, Jeff, by the way. That was a very kind introduction. Uh, by coincidence, um, uh, well, Jeff mentioned the Paul Nelson project, and by coincidence, the gentleman that I collaborated on that project with, Joseph Abram, is also here tonight. Uh, so I'm very happy that that came up. Uh, this is my second visit to the AA. 
the first time was um, a, a while ago, and I was here to interview with Alvin Borowski about coming to school here. And uh, <laughs> this took place in the chairman's office, and he sat across from me, and it was a true interview. I mean, he was definitely trying to find out what sort of rube I was uh, in my brown suit and cowboy boots. Um, and he was sort of testing me, and he said, you know, Mr. Riley, this isn't like school in the United States. You know, we're doing a study right now on nocturnal design, the city of the night. We go out to dance clubs, we go to gay bars, we go to train stations, anywhere where there's nighttime activity. Do you think you could uh, work in a school like this? And I, I think he was watching my face to see how I would react to this proposal. And um, I don't know what he thought, but I, I clearly remember thinking how fantastic it would be if I, get my, if I could get my parents to pay for this. <laughs> <laughs> the title of the talk that I'm giving tonight is called Light Construction. It's actually a work in progress, uh, an exhibition that's being planned for this fall at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, as such, uh, this is, is more of a preview into a work in progress. Uh, and I apologize for what is probably going to be a sort of sense of in incompleteness. The thing that I hate at lectures is when people um, show too many slides and uh, quote too many other people. And uh, I can tell you that I don't have that many slides. That's not the, the problem. But I will apologize in advance for the pre preponderance of quotes that I'm going to be throwing around. The first of which is to paraphrase K. Michael Hayes, where he uh, wrote an essay recently on critical architecture between culture and form. And it's essentially about a reinterpretation of, of Mies van der Rohe. But I will paraphrase his um, thesis and um, open these remarks with uh, the following. The interpretation of a few projects presented here tonight will provide examples of a critical architecture that claims for itself a place between the efficient representation of pre-existing cultural values and the wholly detached autonomy of, abstract, of an abstract formal system. Uh, what I'd like to do first is talk about the possibility of an abstract formal system that I find evident in quite a bit of contemporary work. Um, anyone who is uh, any kind of an observer of the current developments in, in architecture today, I don't think they can help but be impressed by the fascination with transparency that is prevalent among contemporary designers. The architectural historian Anthony Vidler has noted that, quote, in the last few years, as if confirming the penchant of the century for uncanny repetition, <laughs> we have been once again presented with a revived call for transparency. Yet, uh, having said this, I think anyone who looks at projects such as the Getz Sammlung uh, by Herzog and de Muron, the Fondation Cartier by Jean Nouvel, or the ITM building by Toyoido, I don't think uh, you can conclude uh, after looking at works like this, that this is a revival of the, the kind of transparency that has dominated much of what we know as modern architecture in this century. Uh, rather being clear, uh, uh, transparent, in the transparent sense, we're presented with a number of structures which have a much more ambiguous appearance, uh, if anything contradictory to the uh, original goals of the early modern rationalists. For example, with the Getz Sammlung, and I'm sorry, this is one of the slides that should be here that isn't there, but I think most of you have seen it, a very simple volumetric space that uh, continually is referred to as, as sort of being Miesian, but that sort of essential Miesian characteristic, the frame, uh, structural frame defining a, a view is missing. Uh, not only is the glass obscured, but the construction, which is a double wall of obscured glass, uh, has the structure inserted inside. So instead of framing a view, you're dealing with a structure that's now obscured and sort of appears as a ghost behind the planes of the, the facade. Uh, similarly, the uh, Fondation Cartier has a certain level of complexity, even though it is more of a frame structure than the, um, the Getz Sammlung. Uh, it has a level of complexity that 
is due partially to the sort of overlapping buildup of views and multiple reflections that you find in the glass building. This condition uh, is one that the architectural historian Colin Rowe somewhat derisively refers to as the haphazard superimposition of light playing upon a translucent or polished surface. The, um, like the Fondation and Cartier, the sense of transparent, transparency in Ego's ITM building is not simply achieved by putting a curtain wall on a building. Can we have the first two slides? Oh, I do that. Now, how do you lower the lights? Okay. I think you recognize the two projects on the left is Toyota's ITM building, and on the right, uh, Zaha Hadid's um, Cardiff Opera House. Obviously, uh, to repeat the point again, we're not talking about buildings where you are simply applying a glass curtain wall to the exterior of a building frame. There is indeed a sense of multiple layers of space, and uh, these layers of space don't only operate in the lateral condition, uh, seen through the building, but uh, vertically as well. Certain translucent and transparent materials, reflective materials above and below, creating a sort of matrix. Um, one of the critics who has written about Ego's work remarked, the result is an interior bleached of all sense we customarily associate with the materials, sublimated into an experience of weightless, weightlessness in Ego's own terminology. So I, I think there's a sort of demonstration here that we cannot see this as a return to the visual objectivity which inspired many early modern rationalists uh, whose architecture of literal transparency was so pointedly criticized by Colin Rowe. And in Colin Rowe's essay, uh, when he goes to define literal transparency, I don't know if this essay figures as large in your own reading as it did when I was in school, but uh, I'll be referring to it a couple of times. In, in uh, Rowe's essay, he makes uh, an example of Gropius as a sort of example of literary, literal transparency, which he didn't really um, find interesting. Uh, but I think in this instance, now I think this will focus if that is possible to win the right. Uh, Hilberzheimer, Ludwig Hilberzheimer is perhaps an easier, uh, more accessible uh, example of this literal transparency. Um, Hilberzheimer even writes at length about it in an essay called Glass Architecture. And he specifically relates the use of glass to hygiene and economy. And he uh, will only go so far in terms of formal properties to ascribe to it the possibility that it allows you to freely express the structure. Exactly the sort of limited, cyclic uh, definition of transparency that Rowe was so uh, keen to, to uh, go after. Um, Herbersheimer's words, it seems very fashionable to use glass nowadays. Therefore, it is sometimes applied totally without reason, not according to its function, but for formal decorative reasons, to make it interesting. Uh, obviously, an architect who is somewhat uh, suspicious of ar architecture being interesting is going to be a kind of sitting duck for someone with a mind as keen as Colin Rowe. But um, what's interesting is to note that even Hilbert Simer's cyclic approach was not bereft of the kind of secret implications for an aesthetic vision. Uh, continuing his words, the old contradiction of light and shadow that had formed the proportions of past architecture exists no longer. And even we spread an evenly spread light has been created. And he goes on to talk about shadowless rooms, which I find to be actually a very compelling kind of aesthetic uh, implication. But uh, as opposed to these sort of shadowless rooms of hygiene and economy, the transparencies that we're seeing today are the result of not plate glass, but all manners of uh, frosted, mottled, or otherwise partially obscured glass translucent plastic sheathings, uh, double layers of reflective glass or, or clear glass, which uh, even when clear, produce enough uh, reflections to appear like uh, some sort of screen. And of course, in addition to that, there's a sort of infinite, infinite number of perforated materials that uh, seem, to, as is evident in Mr. Ito's work, 
um, to uh, uh, qualify as a, as a transparent material in that sense. The, um, but it's important to distinguish and to, to, to really realize this fundamental difference. I mean, Rem Kohlhaus's Bibliothèque Nationale de France uh, is simply not the shadowless rooms that Hilbertsheimer was proposing uh, on the slide on the right. Now, uh, all of this discussion of Colin Rowe, I, by the way that this presentation has been sort of edited out of a larger piece, uh, Colin Rowe looms a little bit larger, but I did want to include this discussion. Um, I think that uh, for my generation, um, Colin Rowe was, of course, the last word in transparency. His essay, Transparency, Literal and Phenomenal, uh, written in the 50s and published in the 60s widely, had a incredible impact in the United States. Uh, it was the sort of basic underpinnings of the New York Five. Uh, it's heavy emphasis on formal uh, interpretations of modernism, particularly Le Corbusier, very much uh, was part of the New York Five's work. But it, it would also have to be said that his lack of interest in any sort of ideology, any sort of uh, ideas other than the what you might call Epicurean delights of architectural facades, uh, left open that neo plasticism, that uh, neo Le Corbusian uh, imagery of the New York Five, to simply more facades. Uh, and if it wasn't Le Corbusier, it could be Hawksmore. And if uh, it was Hawksmore, all the better. So, in a strange way, uh, for, for me, from an American perspective, Conroe not only underlies this sort of neo avant garde of Peter Eisenman, uh, Glaffney, Meyer, Graves, and Haydock, but also uh, in tandem, Robert Venturi and the postmodernists, and particularly with their emphasis on the facade. Um, Ray had an antipathy also that's very evident in his essay for glass architecture. Uh, I think he felt that the technological, anti-classical ethos of glass architecture was uh, bereft of the kind of intellectual complications which he found interesting in the architectural facade. Uh, his words, a viewer may enjoy the sensations of looking through a glass wall and thus be able to see the interior and the exterior of the building simultaneously. But in doing so, he will be conscious of few of those equivocal emotions which derive from phenomenal transparency. Now, phenomenal transparency was an idea, a, a theory that he um, proposed uh, in contrast to literal transparency. Phenomenal transparency was not uh, an architecture of glass. It was an architecture of facades. But through the skillful formal manipulations, uh, which he traces back to the uh, Cubist painters, uh, he believed that there's a possibility of an abstract uh, theoretical sense of transparency, which he particularly saw in the work of Le Corbusier. This is a page from uh, the essay, The Facade of um, Laura Garsh, which, uh, Laura Stein at Garsh, which he found uh, particularly so provocative, uh, particularly when it was um, necessary to sort of lampoon Walter Gropius. But um, I'd like to return now back to uh, Vidler. Actually, can you, let me see if I can do that. There is the sort of opposition that uh, was proposed by uh, Rowe. Uh, ben Kohlhaus's Bibliothèque Nationale de France. Um, on the left, uh, a maquette of the model. Uh, on the right, a computer drawing of the research library, which is a huge spiral that goes through several floors. Of this project, Vidler says, for here the transparency is conceived as a solid, not as a void, with the interior volumes carved out of a crystalline block so as to float within it in a mutic suspension. These are then represented on the surface of the cube as shadowy presences, their three-dimensionality displayed un displayed ambiguously and flattened, superimposed one on the other in a play of amorphous densities. 
this is, um, now the word ambiguous uh, certainly played a role in, in Rowe's characterization of quote unquote phenomenal transparency. But, uh, and this is certainly what we're looking at here and not what he was talking about literal transparency. But I, I think uh, that it's important to at least say that all things that are ambiguous are not necessarily related. And I don't think uh, what Kohlhaas is doing here has uh, anything to do with this idea of phenomenal transparency. Uh, and I think the distinction between what Roe was getting at and Kohlhaas is trying to do here can be, can be seen in the paintings that Roe used to demonstrate and support his theories of transparency, literal and phenomenal. These are not exactly the paintings he used. I couldn't get slides of them, but they're very similar to the paintings that he used. As an example of literal transparency, um, he referred to the, uh, a painting very similar to the one on the left, which is entitled Maggio Lee by L Picasso, done in 1911. And uh, he described a painting like this as a positively transparent figure in a relatively deep space. In other words, that if you look at the painting, one can discern a figure, a sort of a body, uh, principally uh, made up of a sort of matrix of horizontal and vertical lines, and you can perceive that the body is in a deep and real naturalistic space, which is sort of created by, uh, if you look in each quadrant of the painting, there's a very strong diagonal, creating a sense of depth, of, of depth in real space. And he contrasted this to his idea of phenomenal transparency, which he saw in the works of Bach, which if you look, uh, had very few of the sort of diagonals that established the sort of idea of deep space, and in his mind established a primarily shallow space. Only gradually does the observer become able to invent this space with a depth, or invest this space with a depth which permits the figure to assume substance. Uh, despite this contradiction, which he, even he admits um, is, is a slight but important distinction in his mind, despite the fact that he sees these as, as different sorts of cubism, the thing that's uh, important is that his attitude with regards to both is the same with regards to the, to the viewer. He's talking principally about the visual penetration of the canvas, the sort of visual invasion of the canvas, or by inference, uh, the facade as well. Um, now, Villeneuve, really, to go back, I'm sorry to go back and forth like this, quotes to quotes, but Villeneuve, really, when he's talking about uh, the Kohlhaas project, describes it as, well, he, he says that the subject is suspended in a difficult moment between knowledge and blockage. And it occurred to me that this, this term blockage, you know, if you're talking about transparency, when Rao is always talking about sort of invasion and uh, uh, penetration of the canvas, this term blockage sort of leapt out at me as perhaps giving some sort of clue as to this fundamental difference between contemporary uh, notions of transparency and what Rowe was proposing. Um, obviously, blockage has little resonance with the sort of spatial and physical interpenetrations of the work of Picasso, Bloch, and Le Corbusier, but it has strong affinities with the work of Marcel Duchamp. Uh, this is uh, Duchamp's Grand Vert, which he worked on for a number of years, uh, finishing it, I believe, in the 20s. Um, Octavio Paz makes the point here Whereas Picasso's work presents movement before painting, right from the start, Duchamp sets up a vertigo of delay in opposition to Picasso's vertigo of acceleration. In one of the notes in the celebrated green box, Duchamp writes, use the word delay instead of picture or painting. Picture on glass becomes delay in glass. I think that uh, this relationship, these, these sort of accumulations of word blockage delay as opposed as a strategy uh, to thwart uh, penetration becomes something that we can hook onto a lot of contemporary architecture. Uh, again, a slide I wish I had was the uh, Greek Orthodox Church Project by Herzog and the Neuron. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it was essentially a sort of glass uh, translucent and transparent structure that had another structure inside that was a translucent, translucent onyx uh, on which were etched images of ancient icons that uh, no longer existed. So instead of the sort of immediate invasion of the space, the penetration of light and vision, 
you can almost think of this project as a kind of delay in architecture the way Duchamp uh, proposed a delay in painting. The delay being a kind of filter that interposes issues of history, memory, emotion, and faith, uh, delaying the headlong rush of natural space and visual perception. Uh, Cole House Project, again, various kind of filters, something inserted in between. And uh, the in between also sort of disrupts Rowe's uh, privilege that he gives to the observer of the object as opposed to somebody who could equally be inside the architectural object and looking out. Uh, not only do the uh, facades of the Bibliothèque Nationale have a sort of reading of the amorphous forms within, but on two of the facades, uh, there is a projection of the clouds from uh, the exterior also onto the skin. So the two, uh, 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 from the exterior and the interior, there's a sort of pressure onto the skin, leaving these sort of traces, defining it as essentially something in between, something, an interrupter, a blockage of, of natural space. It could even be argued, um, and I think this, I, I included a couple of slides here that I skipped over too quickly. But uh, this project by Decoy um, um, similarly sort of impresses me as um, being uh, related to this idea of sort of suspension or, or delay. And certainly, um, now that one was way out of whack. Certainly Cole House's treatment, uh, and I'm sorry I don't have the slides of the Bay Area now. So now um, another one here, but this is the Jusu Library. Again, a incredible attention to the quality and nature of the facade uh, with very little emphasis strictly on the notion of absolute transparency. Um, this, this idea of the cloud, I think, actually becomes a kind of an appropriate symbol of this new definition of transparency. Translucent but dense, shapeless but substantial, eternally between the viewer and the distant horizon. Uh, during the jury survey, I mentioned um, the literary cri critic Jean Starobinsky, who wrote an essay called Popeye's Veil, and it was referred to a figure in a play by Montaigne, uh, a woman who veils her face, and uh, quoting Montaigne, Starobinsky says, the hidden fascinates. Why did Popeye conceive the idea of masking the beauties of her face except to make them dearer to her lovers? He continues, obstacle and interposed sign Popeye's veil engenders a perfection that is immediately stolen away and by its very flight demands to be recaptured by our desire. Uh, as opposed to Rowe's sort of cubist emphasis on vision and the penetration that's implied, uh, Starbinsky proposes the word the gaze, which uh, he feels is more relevant to this idea of this interposed veil inserted between. And he says, if one looks at etymology, one finds that to devote, to denote directed vision, French resorts to the word regard, the gaze, whose root originally referred to not the act of seeing, but to expectation, concern, watchfulness, consideration, and safeguard. This is, of course, literary theory, and um, it's not always easy to make a, 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 a clean leap. But I thought that this, this very simple project provided an imagery that maybe can bridge the gap between uh, Starobinsky and, and, and architecture, literature and architecture. These are uh, two projects by Michael Van Valkenburg uh, called Ice Fences. One was done in uh, Cambridge, Mass. One was done in Martha's Vineyard. It's a very simple uh, sort of uh, invention uh, landscape piece. It's a, a garden fence with a hose uh, running along the top, weeping water during frigid temperatures, uh, creating these facades or these skins of ice, which if you look on the right, have um, some of that aspect of sort of veiling or uh, separating uh, that we spoke of. But also, uh, immediately, uh, you know, uh, Foucault was always talking about transparency as some sort of power. Um, immediately, uh, Starbinsky's uh, uh, reference to the words concern, watchfulness, consideration, uh, in terms of offense, I mean, become somewhat uh, more direct. Um, the next project, 
uh, Kazuo Seijima's um, dormitory in uh, Japan, uh, and please don't infer any endorsement of any archaic notions of uh, a weaker sex. This is a women's dormitory, and when I talk about safeguard, concern, watchfulness, it is certainly not in regard to any sort of sexist reference, but it's uh, a different idea about architecture, and certainly a different idea about transparency, that the blockage, that the limitation pr provides a certain kind of space that's fundamentally different from the shadowless rooms uh, of hygiene and uh, economy that Hildesheimer was, was proposing. Um, if you look carefully at the, at the uh, massing of the structure on the left, you begin to see that it indeed is a kind of veiled structure. There's more revealed than one might think uh, at first glance. And uh, when you look inside, you also feel that there is a certain sense of concern, watchfulness, consideration, and safeguard. Um, I think Starobinsky has sort of had implications uh, about the ambiguous, the equivocal, even the erotic. Um, but at the same time, it is incorrect to think that I'm interested in, or I think that even Starobinsky is interested in, a contemporary world of smoke and mirrors where all is illusion, undecipherable and unattainable. Uh, in fact, Starobinsky goes on to propose a, a, another term, the reflexive gaze or the critical gaze. He says, skepticism first warns us against universal deception, then leads us very gently to the idea of recommencing knowledge with a vision that, under the protection of the reflexive gaze, trusts in the world the senses reveal. This world that the senses reveal is certainly the world that Hildesheimer uh, uh, let's say that that world is one of the shadows that Hildesheimer tried to banish in his shadowless rooms. Uh, to further sort of explore this, what sort of ambiguity we're talking about, it seems like everything is ambiguous today. Everything, everything is in between something. So uh, I think, you know, to try to further pin this down, um, I'd like to talk about what is, what, in addition to this sort of reflexive gaze, that means a oscillation, if you will, or a, a going back and forth between uh, the, the sort of certitude of vision and the equivocal nature of the gaze, uh, how that um, uh, operates as, a, as a, a, a viable way of approaching architecture. There is another sort of in-between sort of uh, example that I think could give uh, some um, uh, sense of understanding here. And I'm going to try to draw something on this contraption. And I just stepped on a, wait a second. Okay, can you, what do we have to do, turn this one off? Now this, believe me, is one illustration that would have been much easier to have a slide made of, but um, it's an important illustration, so I want to try to get the idea across. Uh, it, it, in a book uh, published by uh, Hubert Damisch, uh, one of the chapters focuses on Brunelleschi's experiment with perspective. And I, what I think is very interesting about it is that uh, a lot of critics of the nature of modern architecture uh, frequently sort of focus on what they perceive to be a sort of unrelenting relationship between the ideas of perspective Cartesian space and a structural grid. And uh, in the book, he publishes a diagram uh, which is uh, quite interesting. You know that Brunelleschi, what he essentially did was he, using constructed perspective, he made a picture of the um, baptistry uh, in Florence, uh, which he painted on a panel. And then he uh, drilled a hole through the panel and standing behind it, looked through the panel towards the actual um, uh, baptistry. And he held in front of the panel this device, which was like a, Jesus. <laughs> okay, let me finish the drawing so that neither you are looking sideways nor I am drawing sideways. And what was um, interesting about this device is that it was a frame that held in one half of it a mirror, and the other half was open, just 
a, a blank frame. And what it allowed him to do is to look through the back of the, the panel and essentially compare what he had drawn, reflected in the mirror, with the actual uh, baptistry to, to try to see if his perspective system was correct. Um, of course, we all know what happens after the invention of perspective. Uh, it's very tight associations with the um, idea of uh, uh, Cartesian space, the, uh, and from thence the, the structural grid. But what is really fascinating about uh, the recreations of this experiment is that after drawing everything that he could in the perspective, Brunelleschi applied silver leaf to the rest of the panel to reflect the clouds and the sunlight, which he felt were, or actually Leonardo felt, were fundamentally different bodies and had no surface and therefore could not be drawn. But what is amazing is that despite making these distinctions between the ethereal, the transient, and the uh, identifiable, quantifiable, uh, he chose to, to combine them to create what uh, could be considered to be an actual picture of the world. So in other words, the system of perspective from the very beginning was never meant to replace those aspects of the world that didn't nece necessarily fit into it. And I think we can say that sort of vice versa. So in talking about uh, the cloud, uh, the equivocal, the veil, I don't think we're talking about uh, throwing science you know, out the window. It's a, it's a, it's a means of approaching uh, a, an appropriate way of dealing with phenomena in the world to quote Starbinsky again, to trust in the world that the senses reveal. Um, so we'll go back to slides. Oh, and now they get really bad, the slides, for a moment. Uh, it's out of focus. There's nothing I can do about it. But just to talk about how the cloud can exist with perspective, how uh, the reflexive gaze can alternate the vision of, uh, the wisdom of vision with the, the sort of equivocal emotions of the, uh, the gaze. Um, this is a, a small project, uh, which you'll see more of later, uh, in Espo, I believe it's pronounced um, Finland. It was done by some young architects. And it's essentially this very lightweight and very inexpensive structure, corrugated plastic. But uh, a detail about it that I find very interesting and I see over and over in some of these contemporary projects is that the structure, instead of being this sort of frame, the window, is uh, sort of demoted in terms of importance, in terms of the um, amount of influence it has over the overall uh, appearance of the building by being recessed behind the material, the glazing material. And you can see this in Jean Nouvel's um, um, Fondation and Cartier, where the translucent glass of the interior offices doesn't sit within the frame, it wraps the frame. You can see it in uh, the Herzog and Dumeron project I mentioned earlier, and in many different ways. Uh, Shumi's, uh, uh, in terms of the, the de-emphasis on structure as a determiner of architectural form, uh, Shumi's video pavilion, uh, the structure, which is, is you know, it's sort of a glass box, and then the structure is this, um, uh, these glass fins, there's no distinction between what's sheathing and what's skin. Uh, again, the, the structure uh, uh, is sort of uh, diminished. Todd Williams and David Sien's, um sculpture pavilion for uh, Phoenix Art Museum actually has no express structure. It's a huge sort of dome-shaped building uh, made of fiberglass resin panels, each of which is structurally sound in itself. So in effect, when it's bolted together with stainless steel connectors, there is no rib, there is no frame, there is no uh, overall reference. And I think it can be argued that these self-effacing but critical details succeed in revitalizing, or excuse me, relativizing the role of the structure more self-confidently than deconstructivist ploys where tilted columns, destabilized surfaces, and structural redundancies meant to undermine the role of structure frequently achieve the opposite. The specter of the displaced rises up to endlessly haunt the architecture. Um, I think these details also uh, reflect the words of Italo Calvino, and I'm going to mention him a few times, and don't ask me why. 
uh, his references to literature have such a resonance for architecture that they seem to. And um, in regard to these details, uh, as opposed to the deconstructivist place that I mentioned, Calvino says, lightness for me goes with precision and determination, not vagueness and the haphazard. So in other words, there is the possibility of being unambiguous about your ambiguity. Uh, more references to Calvino. I should know I am not, I did not discover or tell Calvino in architecture. John Reichman has written recently at considerable length about this. But he actually comes to a formulation of an idea of what lightness is. Uh, it has three qualities in his mind. It is the, to the highest degree light, it is in motion, and it is a vector of information. This is Toya Ito's Tower of the Wind Projects. I needn't say anything more about it, but quote the architect's own words uh, with regards to these, this triad of, of lightness. The intention was to extract the flow of air, uh, that is the wind, and the noise, that is the sound, from the general flow of things in the environment, in the environment of the project, and to transform them into light signals, that is visual information, lightness, movement, information. Simply put, it was an attempt to convert the environment into information. Uh, another project I wish I could have shown you, and it will be published in this book, is a, an incredibly eloquent uh, Holocaust memorial, memorial designed by uh, an artist called Melissa Gould. And what she did was, uh, in a park in Austria, uh, channeled out full scale the floor plan of a destroyed Berlin synagogue, uh, inserting light tubes in the uh, flight excavation of the floor plan so that at night this floor plan of this destroyed synagogue, destroyed in Kristallnacht, uh, poignantly sort of glowed in the dark. Uh, the visitors' faces sort of uplifted in a sort of ghastly, otherworldly sense. Uh, uh, its movement implied by the fact that periodically it would disappear and just cease to exist. The light would go off. Uh, the reason I want to mention this without being able to show it to you is that I think it's a great uh, example that lightness should not necessarily be confused with frivolity. Uh, continuing along the lines of some of the discussions we had today, the pervasive presence of film, television, video, and computer screens um, should uh, provide us with, um, uh, and I should show you one more slide of the Tower of the Winds to show you exactly how it is capable of transforming itself, rather drastic. Uh, and these are certainly not the only two views, but uh, changes uh, to that extent. Uh, but given this pervasive presence of film, et cetera, and electrical media, it, it should not be surprising that this has somehow found its way into architecture. The project we're looking at, of course, is the um, uh, Center for Media uh, Media Studies in Art, uh, ZKM, by Rem Kohlhaas. Uh, the slide on the right uh, portraying the media wall, which comprises one of the facades. Uh, it's extinguished on the right, but the sort of hulky, mm -hmm. uh, uh, void presence of the building on the left. I think that uh, Kohlhaas's project is probably the most provocative uh, instance of a sort of superimposition of this technology on, on an incredibly vast scale. Uh, but I do believe that you know, other examples exist, possibly to a lesser extent, but they certainly don't uh, discredit uh, the theory. On the right, again, Toyota's Egg of the Winds. And I'm sorry, Toyota, you might have nothing to show tomorrow night for your lecture, but uh, um, on the right, uh, Chumi's um, video pavilion, and I'll quote both of them. Chumi, the appearance of permanence is increasingly challenged by the immaterial representation of abstract systems, television and electronic images. In Ito, a phenomenal city of lights, sounds, and images is superimposed on the tangible urban space of buildings and civil engineering works, almost as if to reformulate. Uh, I mean, this is not a sort of technological Buck Rogers fantasies. This is uh, more, in my mind, a near ref re reformulation of uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein's observation that it seems to me that there is little intangible about the chair or the table, but there is about the fleeting human experience. Now, one of the things that I find quite interesting, though, is that after this, um, and I, I suppose it, it is an ongoing fascination with the media, 
uh, and, and its ability to sort of transform the architectural object. Uh, one of the most interesting developments I see in this uh, sort of new architecture is it's a sort of reflex from learning about the screen through the use of the media. And it's, it's more of an architectural um, um, sort of adaptation of the quality and the presence of the media and the sort of, uh, you know, the way Vidler talked about uh, things flattening out on the facade. I mean, it is possible, I think, and this is uh, Ido's ITM building again. I mean, it is possible, I think, to talk about the architecture. Now, if you look in the ITM building on the right, there's the, cl the clear um, glass clear story, which has this sort of percep perceptible depth of space running all the way back to the back of the room. But in the translucent lower section, all of that space, all the natural space is sort of collapsed into a two-dimensional screen, not unlike one would expect an electronic projection to take natural space, not abstract column and row kind of space, but take natural space and provide an actual uh, projection of real space and real objects onto a two-dimensional surface. Um, these sort of ambiguities and projections, I think, are very literally evident in the glass floor, where uh, there's a, uh, uh, the glass floor, uh, no less than a, an electronic screen, uh, becomes a two-dimensional flattened out um, way of uh, tuning into natural space. Now, um, it occurred to me in developing this project that, uh, particularly in light of Calvino's words, this emphasis over and over on only on uh, transparency was, was not enough, and that um, certain other kinds of architecture, this is Steve Hall's um, uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in Helsinki, this arcing form which you see um, uh, to the sort of lower left-hand side of the screen. This is the, the sort of twisted facade that you see here. Uh, despite the fact that I've been showing a lot of sort of almost minimalist uh, glass uh, encased structures, but Calvino's words lead me to think that um, if we are talking about a sort of light construction, that it isn't just about glass or, or perforations, et cetera. And that, um, in fact, these are exceedingly more complex in, in, in shape and um, in materials. In fact, some of the materials are, are, are not even what you would call uh, transparent. Um, this is, again, Ido's uh, Shimasua Municipal Museum. And uh, it is, in fact, very little of it is, is transparent in the, in the traditional or the newer sense of the word. These are uh, uh, opaque panels, although they are reflective. Um, I think that uh, one of the th things that is notable about both of these structures is that the complexity of these forms isn't unrelated to the simplicity of the forms of the projects we were previously looking at. Um, in both senses, the, you could say that the and this is Starobinsky's quote, that the classical realm of measure and order, figures circumscri circumscribed by their forms, space made rhythmic by a harmonious, modu harmonious module, by a law granting to each vantage an empire at once sovereign and precarious, neither one of these sort of types of buildings, um, and I don't want to rush into a kind of typology of simple rectangles and, and complex forms, but um, both of these sort of undermine that idea of a space that's determined by measure, vision, etc. And uh, I also wouldn't want to say that by looking at um, uh, Ido's project that um, the technology that is somehow associated with this measured kind of space has somehow been defeated. In fact, uh, it's the opposite. In this building, each one of the panels, if I understood the project correctly, is uh, of a unique shape, but that the, um, the way that it was realized was that the computer uh, can handle this sort of information at such a speed that they can be produced um, uh, without uh, significantly increased um, expenses. In other words, technology has sort of overcome the problem of structure, which was once the primary task in design. I'm going on a bit longer than I thought, and I don't want to miss the opportunity to actually finish in a way that makes sense to you, so I'm going to uh, measure my words from now on. Um, to tie this back in 
maybe more closely to the projects uh, that I showed previously, I'll refer to Calvino again. I look to science to nourish my visions in which all heaviness disappears. <coughs> and further, the iron machine still exists, but they take the orders today from the weightless bits. And uh, to make this final leap between uh, what Calvino is talking about in terms of lightness, as opposed to lightweight, again, we're not, I think, looking at something that is talking about a return to lightweight architecture of the sort of cyclic modern rationalists, uh, but lightness. And uh, the relationship between lightweight and light is, is one that I think, uh, as far as Europe is concerned, only exists in um, uh, English. In Spanish, uh, the word for light is luz, or you know, light isn't source of light, uh, is luz, but luz also means span. So uh, the implication is actually an architectural one. The broader the span, the more light. Uh, one could say the broader the span, the more lightness. Uh, lightness then being related to a seeming weightlessness rather than a calculation of relative weight. Uh, as Calvino said, light uh, like a bird, so defying gravity, not light like a feather. Now, when I opened this, I talked about the possibility of a critical architecture where you didn't just talk about form, um, but you talked about sort of cultural, you know, what does this mean? What is, uh, uh, to be critical, I th uh, have to try to bring some of this around to some sort of uh, uh, resolution, I think, uh, in a broader sense, uh, in under 12 minutes. Um, the cultural implications, I think, are, are numerous. Uh, a lot of the buildings uh, that we were talking about, not just the most recent ones, have a particular relationship to technology that I think is evolving and I think is quite important. Uh, Norman Foster is building for Duis Duisburg. Uh, this uh, uh, high-tech center is kind of particularly interesting in this sense, where you see that uh, Duisburg, which was a sort of center of the heavy steel and coal industry, there's now this sense that somehow lighter technologies um, can sort of redeem uh, the environment, uh, to put it uh, in, in the most succinct terms. And to a certain degree, uh, his buildings are, are quite amazing that way. These highly developed uh, double-layered skins uh, don't just have a sort of aesthetic implication, but they certainly have, first and foremost, a sort of isolating um, uh, quality. I don't think it's such a huge leap from notions of delay, obstacle, and isolation. Um, there's also a cultural uh, relationship here that can't be denied. This fascination with light, uh, in one way, is a uh, uh, northern European uh, or a northern phenomena uh, in latitudes where there is not so much light. But uh, it's also a cultural phenomena in uh, a broader sense. Uh, and it, it talks about a bigger sort of cultural dimension uh, than just sort of northern latitudes. And for that, I have to sort of go back to Colin Rowe for, for a few minutes. Um, any sort of student of rhetoric uh, would have to come to the conclusion that Rowe's opposition of literal transparency and phenomenal transparency is not really a dialectic. It's not, um, I mean, on one hand, he's posing a sort of extreme dictionary definition to a, a very abstract sort of principle. On one hand, he's opposing uh, Gropius. Uh, on the other hand, with Cabusier. It's sort of a way duck in, in many ways. I mean, uh, I, I don't think that uh, Gropius, in Rowe's terms, would ever really hold up to a Corbusier. It's sort of the conclusions he came to, I think, uh, um, were ultimately bound to be negative ones, the way the um, that it was uh, argued. You could say that for the argument to make the most sense, you would oppose uh, transparency and opacity. Therein, there would be certainly some sort of paradigm, uh, some sort of di dialectic argument. But within this sort of broad cultural connotation, and I mean uh, Arabic, uh, Judeo-Christian, uh, European, modern, up until uh, Mr. Gropius, that dialectic of transparent and opaque would have 
entailed certain other implications. Uh, transparent, having a near, say, 3,000 year history of uh, uh, sort of relationships in literature and architecture to ideas of personal transformation, magic, utopianism, etc. And the opaque being associated s essentially with uh, the base, the, uh, the uh, material. And uh, amazingly, in the way he sets up this argument, literal transparency gets assigned with having only material qualities, whereas uh, phenomenal transparency somehow becomes abstract and higher-minded. So uh, for the first time in thousands of years, and for my whole generation, Rowe is able to turn uh, the associations with glass uh, principally on their head. And this tradition, uh, I won't go through it in, in huge detail, but uh, in the Bible, uh, the legends of King Solomon, uh, one of the earliest references to architecture in the Bible, uh, King Solomon has a palace uh, with glass floors. Uh, actually, in apocryphal legends beyond it, uh, a glass palace with glass floors. Arabic legends, the New Testament refers to uh, streets of glass. Uh, in the medieval uh, culture, the letter of Prester John refers to a chapel that was uh, as if it was a carbuncle or a crystal. Parzifal, Tristan, both sort of intermingling uh, ideas of the Grail and then subsequently um, the legend of the Venusberg, which was this dark cave with a crystal bed inside, the crystal bed of, of Venus, uh, the dark opaque being meant to represent the mundane and earthly, the crystal bed meant to represent the uh, uh, perfect love, uh, transcendent love. Um, Alchemy, transmutation, transformation, uh, 19th century romanticist, again glass and crystal, associated with a heightened sensory awareness. And I think I have some of the um, expressionists of the 20th century, where glass becomes a sort of metaphor of individual trans, uh, transcendence. And uh, oddly enough, one of the key uh, aspects of this is that the architecture moved, that somehow for it to be a serious uh, uh, representative of the possibility of individual uh, transcendence, the architecture would move. Uh, again, Calvino's word, architecture of light moving and a vector of information. The project's on the right by Crail. One is a city that's sort of suspended in a cradle. The other, uh, another that's sort of hanging from a tree. Um, pure fantasy, and I'm sorry, Jeff, to mention Bruno Taut. This is not meant to be a Taut revival. It's meant more to um, trace the history, uh, sort of fundamental cultural history, of what is referred to as the glass dream. And I'll read you one thing from Taut, though, just to make Jeffrey upset. Uh, the sort of utopian, hoped for, s social transformations uh, in glass are quite sort of dramatic. Should I mark the page by Yes, impractical and without utility. But have we become happy through utility? Always utility and utility. Comfort, convenience, good food, culture. Knife, fork, trains, toilets, and yet also cans, bombs, instruments, and murder. To want only the utilitarian and comfortable without higher ideals is boredom. Oops, I didn't mean to go past that one. Now, uh, I apologize for the, the, the last slide, because I shot it out of a book, and it's indeed a... Um, not a great representation. This is that, uh, that project I mentioned earlier in Espo, Finland. It's called the Leisure Studio. It was done by uh, four young architects in Finland. It's this, um, it's this plastic structure, floor, ceiling, wa not floor, four walls and the, and the roof are all made out of this translucent plastic. In the center is this solid uh, structure, which is a sauna. Um, the way that they proposed the building be used, it was done as a demonstration house for a housing um, uh, exhibition. And it was supposed to be an artist studio. But the way they proposed it would actually be used beyond the exhibition is a, a meeting place for artists to come together and architects to talk about their work, what they're doing, 
uh, to take a sauna together, which is the sort of ultimate um, Finnish sort of social preoccupation. Uh, and interestingly here, uh, uh, aside from um, uh, alcohol, but uh, what's interesting here, of course, is that uh, it's really the Venusberg uh, turned inside out, where the cave uh, has now been sort of consigned to the interior, wrapped in yet another larger glass cave, um, uh, reversing the sort of the, the imagery in that sense. Um, after showing you all these, um, oh, I'll go back there. That's the, the uh, interior of the sauna, uh, which is sort of freestanding there. Uh, you know, I, I wonder what you're thinking that I come to this small, possibly insignificant project at the end uh, after talking about all of our uh, luminaries in the field of architecture. But I have to tell you, I really love this project for all those things that I was talking about. I mean, uh, these are the four characters. They built it themselves. Um, they got half the materials donated. They paid for the rest out of their own pockets to create this funny little utopian project. And I shouldn't say funny, because I actually think it's quite beautiful. But uh, what is the critical message? Uh, yeah, I think maybe we're talking about a certain possibility here of reestablishing, after 35 years of Colin Well, a link that's broad and deep that believes that architecture can now be critical, but uh, in some ways idealistic. Um, I'll close with a last quote, which is a quote that opens the second part of um, Tony Kushner's play, Angels in America. And the person speaking is Alexei Antediluvianovich Prolapsarianov, the world's oldest living Bolshevik. And theory? How are we to proceed without theory? What system of thought have these reformers to present to this mad, swirling planetary disorganization? To the evident welter of fact, event, phenomenon, calamity, do they have, as we did, a beautiful theory, as bold, as grand, as comprehensive a construct? You who live in this sour little age cannot imagine the grandeur of the prospect we gazed upon. And what have you to offer now, children of this theory? What have you to offer in its place? Market incentives? American cheeseburgers, watered-down Bukharanite stopgap makeshift capitalism, nut men, pygmy children of a giant race. If the snake sheds his skin before a new skin is ready, know that he will be in the world, prey to the forces of chaos. Without his skin, he will be dismantled, lose coherence, and die. Have you, my little serpents, a new skin? I think there is the possibility of a new skin, and I think that it's something that we might have seen a bit of here tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs> what now? If there's any questions. Any questions? <laughs> hey, this is London. You're going to have to wait. We have no tradition. Okay. Okay. And go home.